Good evening. I'm Christine Hurley, Director of Production and Special Events at the Institute of Politics. We're pleased to welcome you to this, this evening to the live recording of The Axe Files with Mark Short, former Chief of Staff to Vice President Mike Pence. Before one of our students formally introduces Mr. Short, I would like to mention a couple of upcoming events uh, that the IOP is going to host. Tomorrow, we're going to do another live recording of The Axe Files with former Governor Chris Christie. And then on Friday, we're gonna have a panel discussion regarding the rising role of Asian American, uh, community, Asian American communities in our nation's politics. As with all our events, after the moderated discussion, we're gonna open up the floor to questions from you. Um, as usual, we give priority to our students to ask the questions first. Um, please keep your mask on and then introduce yourself before you begin. Now is a good time to make sure your phones are on silent. Um, and now to formally introduce our speaker is Sanjay Srivatsan. He is a first year in the college and he is helping us out as an event ambassador this quarter. Please welcome Sanjay to the podium. Well, thank you for being here today. Um, it's my honor to introduce to you Mark Short. Um, most recently, Mr. Short served as assistant to the president and chief of staff to Vice President Mike Pence. During his tenure as chief of staff to the vice president, he was a witness to some of the most important events in modern American history, including the COVID-19 pandemic and the January 6th uh, storming of the Capitol. And Mr. Short today serves as a co-chair of Advancing American Freedom, an organization founded by Vice President Pence to promote the ideals of freedom and conservatism and fight threats to America's standing as the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And of course, uh, facilitating today's recording of the Axe Files is IOP Director David Axelrod. Um, join me in welcoming uh, Mark Shaw to UChicago Institute of Politics with a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sanjay and uh, Mark Short. It's great to have you here. Great to have you at the Institute of Politics. The Axe Files, great to see you again. David, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me on the X-Files, and um, it's awesome to be around so many students here at the University of Chicago. It's, thank you for inviting me. It's my honor. We, um, we actually had a brief stint in which we were colleagues uh, at CNN, and I always wondered when I was there, how'd that land over at the White House <laughs> when you came to work at CNN? Because I, I mean, I may be overly sensitive, but I got the sense the president didn't like CNN that much. <laughs> well, you know, I think that probably went both ways. <laughs> to be fair, David, my, my sense from CNN was that probably leading up to the 2016 campaign, the president got a lot of uh, a free airtime on CNN, and I think that there were some at CNN who maybe had a, had a perspective that they wanted to correct that in their coverage of the president. Um, but I, 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 didn't, I didn't have any challenge because um, I was proud of our record and proud to go on CNN to cover it. I wish I had a chance to have more time you know, on the air with you, and I think that one of the few times we actually were on the panel together, unfortunately, was the 2018 election that was a, a sweeping victory for Democrats. That was less fun for me to be on the air with you that night. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, I thought that was a good night. Yeah, I, be, I, was, I bet you did. I, I bet you night. did. So there are a lot of people who I talk to who talk about their circuitous route into politics. Um, you're not one of those people. You were sort of born into this. Uh, talk about your, your, your upbringing in Virginia Beach uh, and your family and your dad who was active in, uh, in politics in Virginia in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s. And well, thank you, David. Yes, my, my father was very active in uh, conservative politics in Virginia. I uh, grew up in Virginia Beach and so I was around it uh, for sure, but I didn't really think that was my path. Um, when I went off to Were you involved in campaigns, right? My dad was, yeah. sure. But, you know, when I went off to college, I sort of felt like I'd go a different path. But I began getting interested in campus politics uh, when I was in school and, and really less of the national politics, but more there. Um, but, you know, you, you say it was less circuitous. But to be honest, um, when I came out of college, I was blessed, I think, to have some really unique opportunities. Uh, one is I, I worked for several years for Ollie North, and um, he taught me a lot. Uh, I think he was foundational to my faith. I think I have yeah, I've, I've seen you say that. Talk a little bit more about that. Well, I think that um, I probably had a certain perspective as to what a Christian is, and um, and probably um, informed some of my college years. I probably didn't um, live up to the best behavior that you would you'd want to exhibit. Right, and, we'll pass over that. Yeah, thank you. We won't go into detail yeah. on that. But you know, 
I was in my early 20s, and I certainly had this impression of what, what I know I did on Friday and Saturday night in our fraternity parties versus when I saw kids marching off to church on Sunday morning. And I was like, well, you know, that's for them, but not for me. Uh, but when I worked for Ali, I remember several times, like, barging into his office thinking I had something important to tell him. And I would see him in prayer, surrounded by other men, accountability group, in prayer with the arms around each other. And it was like, you know, here's my image of a three-time Purple Heart, Silver Star uh, Award winner from Vietnam, the, the macho Marine who I saw with other men in prayer groups. And it really began to change my viewpoint of what is a Christian. And I realized I need, I need to reevaluate that myself. And it started me on a journey to really better understand, I think, my calling and started me on a different walk in my faith life and, and a walk to follow Christ. And, and I, credit, I credit that sort of being around Ollie and seeing that in his life that really helped to, to inform my views. And, how, and how, how, how does it inform your views? How does it inform your, uh, your work in, in, in the public in the public sphere? Well, I think that, as you, as you know, obviously I've been very privileged to work for Mike Pence, and I think that um, when, we, when I first worked for him on Capitol Hill, we had certain rules on the wall, and these rules were, you know, to, one, simple have fun, to promote all House Republicans, but to honor God and to have a servant's heart. I think that's foundational to it. It's believing that we, in our public service, it's important to have a servant's heart that we're here to serve the American people more so than a personal ambition or personal goal. And I think that if, if um, you develop a culture and a team around you that shares that viewpoint, it can help to keep your, your staff united. And we were talking a little bit with some of your students beforehand and questions about some of the current controversy between Biden and Harris and that relationship. And I think it's really important that if you share the same culture in an office, that, that you're there to serve a broader purpose, that you, you avoid some of the drama. And certainly our White House had a lot of drama. Yes, I'd say so. But I think, I think the Vice President's office really stayed out of a lot of that drama. And I think, I think many of the people in that office followed Mike Pence's leadership of having a servant's heart as to why we were there and what our purpose was. Um, how, so you, you talk about working for Mike Pence, and that's a longstanding relationship, and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, from the time he was in the House all the way through his vice presidency intermittently and obviously close. And you're still working with him today on whatever project he, he's working on uh, relative to the, the future. But, um, but you also were the legislative director for, for President Trump. Um, and while he has strong support in the, in the evangelical community, and uh, Russell Moore uh, is here this quarter and has spoken about this sort of split with some elements of the community over this, um, you, you wouldn't necessarily say he exemplified these values that you're talking about. Um, how did that, ha how did the two cultures cohere? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a lot in that question. Um, I, will, I will start by encouraging you who are here, please avail yourself of any lectures that Russell Moore gives or any seminars he does here. He's just a giant in the evangelical world and just your Chicago is lucky to have him. So I certainly hope you guys take advantage of that. Um, with, with my relationship, the, the reason I was really put in that place is because during the transition or even a little before, um, the, the two principals were talking about what would the role of the vice president be. And I think that President Trump viewed it as, well, you know, Mike, you're, you're close to Paul Ryan. You, you were in the House with these guys. A lot of these guys moved on to the Senate. Some you knew as governor. You, you should be point on the Hill, mm -hmm. which is why it was like, well, if I'm doing that, then, then I want short in that role. That's not, by the way, unlike uh, one, uh, one of the reasons that uh, President Obama chose Vice President Biden. Uh, because he was relatively new to Washington. Biden was there for 36 years in the Senate, and he thought he could be useful as an uh, intermediary between the White House and the Hill. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I, I think there's a, people often ask, is there a right role, a right model? And I don't know, each, I think, administration is different, the relationship's different. But I, to be candid, I think after like the first day or two, President Trump saw that that's where all the action was. And so it became more him wanting to be in directly involved in legislation too, and not just delegating that. And how'd that work? 
Well, I mean, I, I think I was able to develop a good relationship with him. I think that uh, I think that in those first couple of years, we accomplished a lot, David. If you go back, in my mind, the, the tax bill was, uh, was a significant accomplishment of huge tax relief. Um, when you consider that we added 7 million jobs in three years before the pandemic hit, unemployment reached a 50-year low, all-time low for African Americans, all-time low for Hispanic Americans, that was a big legislative achievement. You look at the first you know, two years, two Supreme Court justices on our pathway to confirming over 300 of the course of the four years, um, I think that, uh, that we, we accomplished a lot. But the first thing we had out of the gate was a big failure in failing on repealing and replacing Obamacare. And, um, and, and I think that, uh, that we learned a lot through that process too. Uh, but I think looking back, the relationship, I was, I was very proud of what I think President Trump was able to accomplish in that time. There were, um, there were reports at the time that he was aggravated with you because of that, that, uh, uh, that he, he felt you were somehow responsible for, for that uh, bill not passing the, the Senate. Well, I think the reality, as you know, in these roles, if you're head of legislative affairs and it doesn't get across the finish line, then, um, then sure, we all have some responsibility for that. Um, but uh, I think that the, overall, there was a lot accomplished in those, in those first two years. Um, but I think um, on health care in particular, you'll recall that Republicans had campaigned since 2010 on promises to repeal and replace Obamacare. And I think, candidly, Leader McConnell had the best advice in that period. Because he said, my conference, we don't have a big margin. All my members are on record re on for repealing Obamacare. But if you match it with the replacement piece, then your Venn diagram changes. And not everyone's going to be for the replacement piece. And I think the House felt like, look, we have a repeal in place ready. And so actually, they started that on like January 3rd. We didn't come into office like January 20th. The House was way out the gate before the, the Trump administration even came in. And I think, you know, in hindsight, if there'd been an effort, we're gonna repeal, and then we're gonna work on a separate thing to bring us together, that would have had better legislative success. But trying to merge the two was more difficult. It created Wouldn't problem. that have been, I mean, now I'm, you know, obviously I was involved in the passage of the uh, Affordable Care Act, and I have strong feelings about it. Um, given the things that it did do, uh, and we, we shouldn't have a huge debate about the Affordable Care Act here, but given the fact that uh, it did remove the, uh, the, the ban on people with pre-existing conditions that insurance companies would enforce, given the fact that it removed lifetime caps on insurance and a, a number of other things, and given the fact that tens of millions of people got insurance, wouldn't it be risky to just pass a repeal without having a replacement at hand? David, that was exactly the president's viewpoint is he felt like it's a lot harder for me to sell if we don't have a replacement at the same time. So it was more of a marketing concern, but I think embedded in what Obamacare had developed over the last those several years was many federal grants to the states to administer their own Medicaid programs. So the challenge became on the replacement is you had Republican governors calling senators to say, you can't do this because we're dependent upon these resources. And that's why the, the math became more difficult. I, I fully accept, and I think the president's viewpoint was the same. Like, how can I go say, I just want to repeal it without having a replacement in line um, from a marketing perspective? But I think the sheer math of the politics and counting votes, there were votes there to repeal. The, the, the fix is something that divided our conference. Yeah. I think it would have been a, you look, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively popular now, so it, 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 that would have been a, a risky proposition, I think. I don't doubt that you may be, be right about the, the politics within the legislative body. I don't want to lose the thread of your own <laughs> story, and we'll get back to, uh, we'll get back to, uh, to the White House and the interesting times you had there. Um, but uh, I, wa I want to ask you, you know, one of the things that interests me about your biography is the three years that you spent uh, running the Reagan Ranch um, which seems like an unlikely uh, detour. Talk, talk about that. Well, I actually, when I'd come out of uh, college, I had worked at a group called Young America's Foundation, and maybe there's a few members here tonight. Um, and then I'd You could gone, swear them in? <laughs> and then I'd gone to work for, for Ollie. But when Young America's Foundation made the decision to acquire the Reagan Ranch, because there'd actually been a federal effort to protect it as a federal park, there'd been a state effort 
but I think a lot of conservatives felt like the last thing Ronald Reagan would have wanted was American taxpayers to subsidize, you know, his home. So Young America's Foundation, uh, the president at the time, Ron Robinson, saw the vision to say, let, let us go acquire that and use it as a facility to teach young people about Reagan's legacy and about conservatism. And when he, when he made that decision, he asked me to come back with my wife, who was then working at Young America's Foundation, to go out there and lead that project. And David, it was just, it was an incredible blessing for us as uh, people in our 20s to get to go live in Santa Barbara, California, um, and to, to run that project. But, you know, I, I actually felt yeah, like- Yeah, contact with Miss, Mrs. Reagan during that project. Uh, very much so. She, um, she actually came to the ranch and um, we, had, we had scheduled like a TV interview to announce the acquisition. And Mrs. Reagan called and said, you can't do that. And you know, we sort of felt like, well, we've now bought it. So I um, think that would be our decision. But she said, no, you can't do that. And so we, we didn't because she said, I want to bring all of Ronnie's stuff back. And she, she drove up and, uh, and came there and spent several hours with my wife and I putting all the president's old memorabilia back in where they belonged inside the house. And it was, it was, it was an emotional time because when she departed, you know, she knew that would be her last time ever going. And so it was emotional for her to sort of say goodbye at that point because this was uh, at a point that President Reagan was pretty far advanced in his Alzheimer's and they couldn't use the ranch physically anymore. And so... Um, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Reagan came back to, to deliver those items, and it was um, it was special, and it's something that we'll, we'll always always cherish. Emotional for you guys as well. Of course, I mean we're like in our 20s, newlyweds, and like we're like in an incredibly historic moment, and uh, and that was special. But you know, back to your to your earlier question, I had these experiences like, well, this has all been fun, but what else am I going to do? And so I went back to MBA school thinking that I was going to get out of politics. That was my whole vision. It's like MBA school sell you is, is career shift. And so I went back to MBA school down at University of Virginia thinking that would be my transition. The classic out bailout strategy. <laughs> well, it may have been. It may have been. But you can see that, uh, that it ended up sort of boomeranging back into the political world. You, you did. And um, uh, some years later, you became the chief of staff to a senator, Kay Bailey Hutchinson of, of Texas. Um, one of the things that you worked on there was actually the immigration issue. Uh, and she had her own uh, sort of Im immigration reform proposal that would have expanded guest worker uh, permits in, in exchange for uh, some strictures around enforcement. Um, pretty moderate uh, proposal, I would say. That was kind of raised years later against you as if you were some kind of left winger. Um, tell me about working on that issue and and the way people interpreted it later. Well, I, I think that, uh, honestly, that was my introduction to Mike Pence, because the House partner on that legislation was Mike Pence. And the idea was that um, I, I think that there were sort of two camps in our party. Uh, one, that, um, that the, the Bush op presidency was advocating the policies that I think many felt was more amnesty. And then there were others, I think, took a more hardline stance against immigrants. I think that where Senator Hutchison and Mike Pence and many of us felt is that um, we want America to be a place for immigrants to come. We, we believe that this is, this is, in many cases, their last best hope, and, and it's a better opportunity, but it needs to have a legal process. And part of that starts with securing the border first and foremost. But there needs to be a process because in many cases we need those guest workers for our economy. And so the plan was to figure out a way, how do we do this where we also invest in securing the border but create a, a, a legal pathway for people to come in and work in America where the jobs are needed. And, um, and, um, and that I think, I think it was a policy perhaps a little bit before its time. We'll see, David. But, uh, but that was my introduction to Mike Pence. Yeah, well, you know, look, I'm the son of an immigrant, forever grateful. Uh, for this country and what it offered. Um, but um, how, how did you guys um, feel years later in the White House where there was a very hard-edged kind of anti-immigrant sentiment? I'm not sure that some of your colleagues in the White House, Stephen Miller and others, would suggest that we should be inviting immigrants into the country and that immigrants strengthen the country, yeah. which I strongly believe. But um, the president made pretty good uh, 
you know, political hay with his base uh, making a different argument? I think that um, I think there's two there's two sides to that coin. On the economic side, I think there are plenty of people in the White House who had criticized that plan. So you're 100 percent right in sort of a different economic view as to whether or not that's advantageous to our economy. But I think that many of us candidly share the president, and many people I think we're, we're unified in the belief that you have to secure the border first. And um, and I think that there there was no no separation in the belief than support for building a wall and support for saying if we're, we need to make sure this is done legally and that the flow of illegal immigration is is a much bigger problem. And I think I think you know we saw so much. Well, of that. Let me just interrupt for a second. What about cutting the idea of cutting legal immigration in half? I, I think there's probably a difference of opinions there among okay. many in 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 the White House. Um, but I think uh, that one of the things that we did see is, is that it, it, it is a personal tragedy because there are so many incentives for people to give up their children to coyotes and others to get across the border for financial incentive. And um, it's, I think that we, I think that there is a much broader coalition to say we have to secure the border first and then we can figure out what we're gonna do for those that we need to benefit our economy. You know, you mentioned earlier um, what your faith means to you and Christian values mean to you. Is that partly what informs your feeling about those issues? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I would hope I would hope that my faith informs a lot of my a lot of my views. Um, but but sure. I mean, I, I, I think that um, uh, it's it's hard not to recognize that um, that biblically, um, in many cases. Um, our people were um, in foreign lands, and, it, and I think that biblically it informs us um, to um, uh, to care for aliens in our land. So, 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 sure, sure. But I, I also think there's plenty of of of, of evidence um, for a strong border security as well in our faith. And I think that um, again, that's that's probably where I come down is to say we need to secure the border. We need that, mm -hmm. but there also needs to be a pathway for for legal immigration to this country. And evidence. I'd like, I hope that I'm one of it. One piece of that evidence that uh, this country has renewed itself generation after generation, in part because of the contributions that immigrants make. I think that uh, if you listen to the vice president, you go back to the speech he gave when he accepted the nomination in 2016. He talks about his grandfather arriving at Ellis Island. And who would have thought that a grandson would have been actually nominated to be vice president of the United States one day? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I remember standing in Moscow uh, at a, in a delegation with President Obama and the Russian Army Band playing the American National Anthem mm. uh, in a ceremony there. It happened to be the night before my, uh, what would have been my father's 99th birthday. And I thought about all they went through to get to this country and what he would have thought to see his son standing there uh, next to the President of the United States. And, you know, one of the, um, one of the more emotional things we did is that uh, on several occasions the Vice President led the swearing-in ceremony for new immigrants into our country. He did it on July 4th. He did it down at the National Archives. We did it in the Vice President's office on many occasions. And, um, and I, I, I think it's, it's, it's a very powerful moment, and you see the joy people becoming American citizens. But David, they also, there's also appreciation that they did it the right way. No, I, they waited I, look, I, to get that opportunity. Yeah, I, I, I understand that uh, debate and, um, and discussion. Um, but I have to believe there must have been some moments when you, there must have been some cringeworthy moments when you saw some of the rhetoric flying out of the White House on, on, on these issues that went beyond enforcement. Again, I, I think that um, there is probably a lot of different rhetoric over the course of the four years, um, but um, uh, still, I think, agreement in many cases on the policy. Mm -hmm. um, you went to work for the Koch brothers uh, uh, after your experience in the, in the Senate, um, and uh, they, they were really, really instrumental in a kind of Republican renaissance around the country threw a lot of money at it. I think you distributed a bunch of it. Um, talk about that and um, the role that um, their various enterprises played in recapturing state houses, uh, legislative seats, and ultimately uh, Congress. Well, uh, I'd say that um, Charles is the, is the one who's really 
uh, developed the company and, and is a headquarter in Wichita. And, and I think Charles is a very um, strong libertarian. And, um, and I think he certainly felt that where we were in our country was a, a, a larger and larger government. And he wasn't always comfortable partnering with Republicans. But he was committed to saying, what can we do to advance policies that limit the role of government in our lives? And, um, and I think I learned a lot by being in Coke Industries because um, there's, there's, again, a certain culture there that, um, that fosters a, a, a approach of humility, but also um, a real culture that, that is a successful one. And I think that took some of that with me in, in future jobs. Um, but but Charles is is a visionary in a lot of ways, and I think he's been he's been incredibly successful. But as you know, they've retreated from the political battlefield in many ways. And I think I think Charles perhaps became disillusioned that a lot of the Republicans that he helped elect didn't share his same vi vision for a limited government. He um, and and to to put a finer point on it, um, he he wasn't supportive of President Trump. Uh, no, he was not. Yeah, was that one of the reasons for his disillusionment, you think? You know, I think the disillusionment started before that, honestly. Um, I think that, uh, I think in many cases that, that a lot of what we did in the 2014 cycle to elect Republicans, um, he, would, he would travel and, and talk about his business and his philosophy and his interviews would always be interviewers saying, well, tell us about taking over the Republican Party. And I think he resented that because that, that's not what he was focused on doing. It's like, no, we have a bigger purpose in mind. And, and I think this, the struggle of getting that message through was, was a frustrating one. I think by the time he got to 2016, candidly, he, he was already uh, less involved in, in the Republican politics at that point. Um, but there's no doubt that he was pretty vocal about his... Um, why was it? Why, why, did he, why was he so vocal about his concerns about Trump? Well, I think that there would be a lot of reasons. I think, for one, uh, on the policy front, on trade, Certainly, Charles would be a, a proud free trader, and, uh, and I think that uh, he was concerned about Donald Trump's positions on trade. Uh, I think as well, though, that um, um, he, Charles would, would look at people and view it as from a lens of, okay, what is the philosophical foundation there? And I think that, um, I think that President Trump tapped into a frustration that was visible in a lot of Republican voters. Um, but probably didn't have the same philosophical underpinnings that Charles uh, was looking for in candidates he supported. Um, the, uh, I've got a few questions about this. Just last question on the Koch, uh, uh, on the Koch brothers and, and their political operation. One, one thing they did is they elected a heck of a lot of members of Congress who sat on committees that oversaw the oil and gas industry and uh, that was Im important to them. Um, that creates a, a great deal of cynicism about government and the power of money in government and raise questions about their motivations. I have no doubt that Ch Charles Koch is a very committed libertarian and they were actually very deeply involved and have been in the, in the criminal justice reform issue for that reason. Um, but, um, what do you say to folks who say they basically used a lot of money to uh, uh, to impose their will on issues that were of importance to their pecuniary interests? You know, I'd say that that's honestly a lot of misinform misinformation. And why I say that is because if you know what Coke actually spends its money lobbying for, they would spend money every year lobbying against their own interests. What I mean by that is, they lobbied to get rid of all of the deductions to the oil and gas industry. People don't know that. The media doesn't want to cover that because it doesn't fit their narrative. But their viewpoint was, we want a flatter tax code, and you shouldn't be picking winners and losers. And so it's for the same reason they would argue we shouldn't be having these tax incentives for electric vehicles either. But they also were in the same camp saying we shouldn't be having these tax incentives for oil and gas companies. So Coke actually spent a lot of money fighting against things that were in their own personal interest financially, David. But I know that doesn't fit the media narrative that they wanted to say, oh, here are these rich guys who are overtaking the Republican Party running Republican politics. I think much of that was just candidly bad reporting and bad information. Do you think most of the people that they helped elect uh, then uh, went on a, uh, on a crusade to eliminate 
tax incentives and no, I, I think it's again. My point is that is that I think it's one of the reasons they they became disillusioned because in many cases that um, the many of the same Republicans that they were electing didn't share the same view of, of limited government. I mean, look, one of the conversations that, that, that I'm sure we'll have is that in, in the world of uh, of what Charles and David were advocating, the world that I think libertarians fight for. Republicans and Democrats alike are responsible for this enormous uh, deficit that we have. I mean, th that's not a one-party problem. Both parties have contributed to massive government spending, and I think that um, that they were they grew disillusioned in that as well. Yeah, I'm going to leave aside because you're too you're too good and you're too smart to answer this question. So uh, about the degree to which the tax cut of 2017 added to the debt. Um, but but no, let me ask I'll, you a different me, question. No, 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 no you can't want... throw that out there. You can't throw that out there and not let me answer it. If you actually look at revenues that came in in 2018, 2019 to the federal treasury, they increased. Go look it up yourself. After the tax cut in 2017, revenues to the federal treasury increase. The problem with our deficit is the spending increased even more. Our country doesn't have a revenue problem. Our country yeah, no. has an enormous spending problem. Yeah. I knew that was what you were going to say. Go look but, it up. The no, data's no, there. No, no. I mean, the, the question is, what would rev revenues have been uh, relative to? Uh, you well, know. you can tax 100 percent if you want, David. No, no. But the cost. There are fixed costs of government that go up: uh, Medicaid, Social Security, other things. So you keep expanding them. Yeah. Well, should we eliminate them? What should we do? I, look, you know, I'm probably in favor of uh, a lot less of a lot of those programs, David. So. I wouldn't have a hard part about eliminating a lot of those programs. Mm. Um, so Social Security, you would? No, I mean, look, we can go through the whole list if you want. But, but yeah, do I, do I believe that in many cases that we've what expanded, do you think government should we've be expanded doing? eligibility for people beyond what I think original intent of much of that legislation was? Yeah, I do. Well, it also lifted generations of seniors out of, of poverty. That's worthwhile, isn't it? Well, sure, if you believe that that's what it did, sure. I, I do. We, I think we can all support that you should lift uh, <laughs> generations of elderly out of poverty, but I'm not, I'm not a believer that the government's actually the one doing that. What should the government be doing? You, you landed at an airport here and you drove across the, the although they told me, you told me they took you on a lot of side uh, streets, so, um, but you should have come down the highway that was built uh, by the Interstate uh, Highway Act that Dwight Eisenhower passed, the airport was built by, uh, in part by government money. Um, there are lots of things that uh, we rely on that have actually enhanced our economy, enhanced our lives, uh, that were paid for by government because no business was going to build the interstate highway uh, system. Uh, so w tell me what you think the appropriate parameters are. Well, I, I guess the way that I view it is I think our founders had a very uh, limited view as to what the responsibilities of the federal government are. And they definitely didn't mention airports. Well, they didn't mention airports, David, you're <laughs> right. I, I do think it's fair to say there's a government role for infrastructure, but I, in my preference, I'd rather see state and local governments doing a lot more of that than the federal government. Um, so uh, so I, I think that um, um, you were asking me before, what is a conservative? Yes. In, in my mind, a conservative is, is, is somebody who is trying to conserve what our founders gave us. And I think they gave us the most remarkable form of government in the history of mankind. And I think that conservatives want to protect that. And I think that um, their debates as to, you know, certainly uh, 250 years later, th things, are, things are changed. And you couldn't foresee that we would have airplanes. I, but at the same time, if we go back to what their intent was and keep government limited, I think it creates far more freedom for Americans. Because I do believe as soon as, as, soon as government begins to take over more and more responsibilities, the, 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 the other part of that equation is it naturally means less freedoms for Americans. And, um, and so uh, I, I believe that the conservatives should be fighting for what, uh, what our founders gave us and wanting to preserve and protect it. Do you think that all, when you consider the, the, the Republican panel plea right now, do you think everybody agrees on what the definition of, a, of conservatism is? I mean, is Donald Trump a conservative? I don't think that, that there's a general consensus as to what a conservative is, David. Um, but I also don't think there probably is in the Democrat Party as what a liberal is. Um, so certainly not, not at this moment. Um, 
let's be, I, I want, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't get to the, to, to the Trump years, and we talked a little bit about the, the, uh, the legislative piece. You left after, after the first two years, and then you came back eight months later uh, to be chief of staff uh, to uh, the vice president. Why, why'd you come back? Well, I mean, again, I, um, I, I, I'd like to think I have a certain uh, relationship with the vice president where I've, uh, I've always considered an honor to work for him. And, um, you know, at that point after the midterms, um, I, I probably envisioned there was political peril for the administration. And at that time, Mike's chief had departed, and so there was a vacancy. And he and I had conversations about, about coming back. It, it wasn't entirely easy. I mean, I think that for, for us, we have, I'm blessed to have been married to the same woman for 25 years next summer, and we have three kids at home at the time. And so you know personally, it's a yeah, big sacrifice. It is. And, um, and, and so it is. And let me speak for my wife, it is. <laughs> It is a sacrifice, but it's also an incredible honor. And I think that, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, m to be candid, my kids had a lot of fun in those years. Um, um, aside that I wish more people were able to see, but, you know, President Trump was always incredibly kind to, to my kids, and they were able to come over for when the Washington Nationals won the World Series and be there, when the Clemson Tigers won or the LSU. And, and they, they, my boys loved those sports ceremonies. Um, my daughter got to read at the Easter egg roll um, to the littlest kids. And so those were family experiences mm -hmm. that, that were fun. And I think that, um, you know, so they were supportive of me doing this a second go round. Um, but um, again, I, I've always felt a closer bond with the vice president. I feel like I match up with him philosophically. And, um, and I think when you find people like that, I'm sure your personal experience will identify that when you find people that you really feel like you identify with philosophically and temperamentally, it's an incredible joy to get to work for them. Yeah, and if you have that bond of trust, which is so important to deal with all the slings and arrows that come your way. Yeah. Um, so let me talk about a, a chapter that probably wasn't as much fun, uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the vice president was chosen by the president to oversee this uh, COVID task force. How did that come about? How did you feel about it? And then let's talk about how that evolved. Uh, well, um, I felt like that that's an assignment that um, there's no political upside to, to be candid. And so I felt like it was a treacherous assignment to, for the vice president to take on. Um, but I think his, again, mantra was, he's here to serve, and if that's what he's asked to do, he's gonna do it. And so when the president asked him, he didn't equivocate. He said, if that's what you want me to do, I will take on that responsibility. Um, I think that uh, um, it was long as far as um, the time that was committed to that. I mean, you, you, the White House hours really today with your phones and other electronic devices is 24-7. Um, but certainly intense during the COVID um, time. And I think it was, I think that the vice president was able to add a level of empathy to be able to talk to the American people about knowing what they were going through and knowing how hard that was. Um, but, um, but it was, you know, I, I look back and say, is it, is it the right decision to bring something like that inside the White House? I don't know. I know it's, it's not a fair apples to apples comparison, but when the Obama administration faced swine flu, they left it to CDC and HHS to govern. Maybe you have a different perspective, but that's sort of the way history records it. And arguably, when you bring it in the White House, it politicizes things, whether you want it to or not, whether mm -hmm. you intend to or not, it automatically does in the way that it gets covered. And so- um, I think I th that's what was the thought back in the day on, the, on you know, I think the Obama's thought was, this should be where the scientists are becomes more political when it comes I to I think that that's the right thought. I do. But it is a different, it is the, the reality. Trump never was, called him. He could have Well, called. the COVID was different, too. Yeah. And so, I mean, the magnity of it was different. Um, and, but I think, I think that uh, there is wisdom in keeping it at CDCH. So you were, you were deeply involved in this? Yes. Yeah. We should note that both uh, Mark and I had a full head of hair when we went into the White <laughs> House. So uh, it does have an impact on you. I uh, I can introduce you to my barber if you want. <laughs> I, I, I could go in there for two minutes and take care of business too. Um, so um, 
what, what did you know? How did this, I mean, there was so much you didn't know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and there's been a lot written about what the president knew and when he knew it and so on. Um, when did you know just how ferocious and dangerous and uncontrolled this would be? I think it was in phases, to be honest. I think initially, keep in mind that the vice president was um, was tapped to lead the task force um, February 26th. So at that point, it had started in China at the end of uh, 2019. It had begun to spread internationally. It had come to the United States. It had begun communal spread before he was put in place of the task force. So talking to the doctors at that point, it was pretty clear what their concerns were in seeing um, how infectious it was. But to Was be, that frightening? Sure, but I think even they didn't know. Like they can, they, they knew pieces of it, but one of our challenges was that China never allowed CDC and other agencies to get inside and study it there when it was first starting. So America was already handicapped in, in not having access to the real information. And so I think a lot of our, our best doctors were still trying to catch up and learn about the virus you know, in real time. Yeah, but you could see what's going on in Europe, so you were beginning to... You began to, yeah. you know, of course, through February, March. Um, yes, that, that became so more there alarming. Were, there was a strange thing where the president... And I'm, I'm sure it was because he didn't want to throttle down the economy. He was worried about all of that. But he was denying, denying, denying the seriousness uh, of this. And then, and, and meanwhile, the vice president's holding these briefings that were dry but informative with the experts. And then it seems to me, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, that somewhere along the line, both the severity of it but also the fact that Mike Pence was having a very well-watched television show every day uh, occurred to the president. And r- around mid-March, he decided, I'll take over the podium here. How did that change the character of these briefings and change the trajectory of the, com- of the message from the White House to, because those things became sort of freewheeling political potpourris as much as anything. And we did get, you know, some strange advice. <laughs> well, I think that um, the vice president was tapped in part because he'd been a governor. And I think that one of the things he would advocate is our job at the federal government is to give the states the resources they need and to inform them. And it's up to the states, in many cases, how they measure that. And so I'm sure there are people here who, who have different viewpoints on what the role of government should be in that case. but. Different governors handle different ways. And I think that's our Federalist approach. And I think that the the Vice President also knew that important to any public health emergency is how you communicate it. And I think that that he um, he did, uh, I think he did a, a, a very effective job when he was leading the briefings to talk about um, both what the, the experts were advising, but also expressing empathy for the I understand. Experts. You said when he was leading the briefings. Yeah. Then he stopped leading the briefings. Well, I, I mean, you're asking me to speculate into, into why the president's team decided he should be out front. I don't and know. I, but I, I, I added why I thought he did, but I'm asking what the effect was but, when he took over the podium. Well, sure. I, I think that it changed, because I think that the president was, was far more combative uh, with the media. And, and I... And, um, uh, there's, there's different viewpoints on, um, you know, that style, but I think that in the midst of a, of a public health crisis, there was probably a desire for less combat and more give us the information we need to make decisions. I mean, did you go back to the office and close the door and say, I'm not holy gonna, <laughs> sh- I'm not going to say what we I said I know you guys probably doors. don't talk like that. We're not going to say what we said behind closed doors. <laughs> but... but um, but, you know, but there I, must have been those moments. There, there's no doubt there was a different style. The VP, yeah, okay, <laughs> nicely done. Um, the VP um, uh, in April said that he thought that this would largely be behind us by Memorial Day. And he meant Memorial Day 2020, mm-hmm. not 2021. Mm-hmm. Um, why did he, what was he, what, what caused well, him to say that? And did, and did he look back at that? And say, man, we missed that one. Well, I, I think I think there are a couple things. One is that you had seen at that time, as you've seen, we've had several cycles of this, and that was like the end of the first cycle. And um, there were a lot of 
it wasn't just the vice president. There were a lot of people, doctors on the task force, believing the same. Well, thing. and we look, I mean, in fairness, uh, no one saw the Delta variant coming. We thought we were through this in uh, July of this year. I mean, this thing has been a, a persistent menace, so with lots of chapters. Yeah. But, um, you know, I'm just... I, I think that at that point, David, in the, in the pandemic, the biggest concern in the early months was, what are we gonna do to make sure that people have the equipment they need? And I think by the end of that period, we had sourced so many things from overseas, and we then had so many American companies who were voluntarily saying, let me turn my manufacturing plant into a plant to produce ventilators. And so we were all of a sudden, we were at a different stage where in the early months, it was like, it was truly a concern and a fear that our hospitals wouldn't have what they needed to treat patients. By that point, it was like, okay, the, the, the virus is coming down, but also we're not gonna be back at the same point because now we have the equipment to treat patients that we didn't have before. And I think that was really the driver behind, behind um, the statements of that time. But, you know, I, I was sharing with your students um, earlier, some of these questions came up as well. And I think that going back, one day history will look at this in a different light. They will say, you know, when this pandemic started, there was no tests. Nobody had tests for coronavirus. Yet by the time we got out of the administration, we'd conduct over 300 million. Today it's been billions. That people didn't have ventilators and American companies stepped forward to produce ventilators out of car manufacturing plants and air conditioning plants. And it's, it's amazing what happened. And so people had ventilators. And to think that you didn't have just one or two, but actually three vaccinations within a year. Yeah, and that phenomenal. today, yeah. half of the globe would have been treated because of American companies, American pharmaceuticals producing those vaccinations. It's actually a fairly remarkable story. It is, but it's tempered by the fact that 770,000 people have lost, Americans have lost their lives and five million across the world. That is the nature of a, a, a of, of pandemic and perhaps we could have done uh, better, but I think people are really eager to, to have a history look back at this and get it behind us, which we're still, uh, which we're still uh, struggling to do. I can't uh, let you go without asking you about the way the administration ended. Uh, and sure you can. The, uh... <laughs> okay, let me correct that. I could let you go, and perhaps it would be the friendly thing to do, but no, that's not true, because um, it's a really important thing to, to talk about. And, um, uh, Tell me, uh, first of all, um, take, a, take me through these. A year ago or at this time, you know, we were still, there were still, I think that the race had been declared, but there was still a lot of back and forth. I mean, what, what were your thoughts at that time? When did, you, when did you say to yourself, or did you say to yourself, you know what, this, this puppy's done? This election's over, uh, and it's time to move on. Um, I feel that there were a lot of concerns that a lot of voters had um, because it was an unusual election for lots of reasons. Conducting an election in the midst of a pandemic, I think, created a lot of additional challenges. And there was decisions by um, people I feel unelected in some cases, they were judges. In some cases, there were other officials who unilaterally made decisions to say, we're going to extend early voting. We're going to uh, do universal mail-in balloting. And I think that undermined confidence in a lot of people. Well, partly because the president kept telling them that this was a prelude to fraud. Okay. Let me let me. Finish. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I think there, there was you, already. You took a breath, and I took advantage of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was, there was, there was I think, um, a lot of concern, and I think that um, for many of us from a process concern, there's a belief that our founders wanted elections governed at the state level. It's actually in um, the Federalist Papers. They talk about it. They didn't have concern about China, Iran, Russia interfering in our elections. They had concern about Great Britain interfering in our elections. And they said, it's why we don't want it federalized because it's all done in D.C., it's too easy for a adversary to do it. We want this governed at the state levels. And so I think as a conservative, that's what you want is the state levels. And 
I think... How would they have felt about the president calling people let at me, the state let level? Let me finish. And, well, you took I, another breath. But I, I, I think that the, the conservatives and Democrats alike have misinterpreted that because when Nancy Pelosi offers H.R. 1, I think it intended to federalize elections. But I think we also as conservatives need to respect the state certification process. And they certified the elections. And so we may have concerns about what transpired or what, how there were new rules made, but we have to trust the states to certify them. And they did certify them. And ultimately, the, the campaign had opportunities to present their case in court and lost. Ultimately, you have electoral college that speaks, and it spoke on December 14th. And so um, I think that those processes are there that allow due process, but the reality was um, um, I was anxious for the campaign to provide specific evidence to suggest they'd found fraud. And there's a lot of theories, there's a lot of allegations, a lot of conspiracies. I didn't hear evidence. And you know, I actually heard that from many senators who would say, I want to be helpful leading into January 6th, but the campaign's not given us any real evidence that we can, we can count on. And, um, and I think that um, I do have legitimate process concerns about what transpired. And I am supportive of a lot of the election reform laws that are happening across our country, but I'm supportive because they're being governed at the state level, which is what they're supposed to be. And we need to trust that if they've certified the election results, that, that that's the process that's in place. Um, I don't want to go down that road uh, about you know, the appropriateness of the Voting Rights Act over the years and so on. That's a discussion for, uh, for a different day, but um, do you think the president was misled by the people around him? Oh, I, I've been very candid about that. I think the president, um, received awful advice, and I think that um, um, uh, I think that in many cases um, some of those uh, people were provided unfettered access. Um, uh, there's been a lot of coverage of um, uh, one of your own alumni, uh, John Eastman from the University of Chicago, who provided yeah, we, some of those. We try and keep that on the down low. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, you can, I would I would take uh, comfort that. Um, I think one of the people that was advising the vice president and what his role is, um, who I think was, was exceptional in his counsel, is likewise a University of Chicago Law School alum. Who's that? Less known, but Greg Jacob was the vice president's general counsel. So, you know, All maybe, right. maybe one day here one in Chicago, you could, you could have a debate between your, your, two, <laughs> your two alumni. About All right, it. let me make a note of that. <laughs> uh, but but um, you were the recipient of some of this advice. I mean, and I know that let me just preface this and save you the trouble. There are probably, you, you probably are going to have to testify to this at some point here. So I know there are things that you can say and probably things your lawyers would not like you to say. Um, but um, it's been reported, and I think you've, you've, you've uh, talked about it. There, there's a book that's coming out. Dave, David Drucker has a book coming out in which you were quoted uh, about some of the memos that you received. Uh, interpreting or telling you how the vice president could somehow interpret his role and his mandate uh, to throw out uh, electors. As I say, I, I think that um, I think the president was uh, was ill-advised throughout this process, and I think that um, uh, there there's two historical examples that um, that those who interpret that. Um, the vice presidency has this magical power that no vice president has ever used in 250 years of our country. And that this magical power, um, the only examples they can cite are uh, Thomas Jefferson and Richard Nixon. So if you delve into these two examples, um, in Thomas Jefferson's case, it's before the 12th Amendment to the right. Constitution has been ratified. So that's an important point to make. But in 1801, the challenge was that the electors from Georgia, they had a clerical error on the paper. And Thomas Jefferson said, well, let's, let's go ahead and accept them. Now, of course, he's sitting in the chair and it's his election. And so people may say, well, he shouldn't have been in the chair for that. But there was never a question of where Georgia voted. There was never a question of what one state did or a different state. Georgia was basically saying, we voted for Jefferson. There's a clerical error on the paper. So to use that as a historical example that the person, the vice president, has this astronomical power to unilaterally choose what electors to throw out. 
is absurd on its face. The second case was Nixon, and that was 1960. And Nixon, at that point, it's the first election Hawaii had voted. And Hawaii's first ballot came back for Nixon. They did a recount, and it came back for Kennedy. In that case, you actually had a unique circumstance where you had two different slates certified. Nixon says, I think in the interest of the country, we should give these votes to Kennedy. He's won. He should go to him. In Congress, are there any objections? Twice he allows Congress the opportunity to object. Congress does not object. He does the magnanimous thing and gives the electoral votes to Kennedy. That's not a historical precedent to say that the vice president has this authority to unilaterally throw him out. And further, there was no separate slates from any of the states in contest or in controversy. There was no separate slate from Arizona. There was no separate slate from Pennsylvania, no separate slate from, from Michigan or Wisconsin. And so, again, this, this, this theory is, is um But let, let's, let's, let's jump this. ahead because I want to, uh, I don't want to, um, I mean, the, the night that all of this was adjudicated is now, you know, it's a date that will live in infamy, uh, January 6th. People have sort of, as the date recedes in memory, some people have uh, minimized it. But you were right in the middle of it. You were at the vice president's side. Um, tell me what you can about what your feelings were at that time. You had crowds chanting, hang Mike Pence. There was a gallows out there. Uh, he was fulfilling what he thought was his constitutional duty. And uh, tell me what, what was going through your mind. And were you, were you worried? Um, well, on, um, on that morning, uh, we had gathered at the vice president's residence and kind of talked through the day and finalized um, a public statement that he put out that I would commend all of you to read because it, it goes through the rationalization as mm -hmm. how he sort of, despite the pressures, came to the conclusion that he did. When we went to the Capitol, it, Secret Service, as you know, takes a different route. So we took a different route. We didn't go down Constitution Avenue. and so. Were we aware that there were rallies? Yes, but we really didn't see much of, of what was um, marching down to the Capitol. And, um, and so we were at the Capitol probably about noon, and, um, and the Vice President's you know, statement goes out about 1245. Um, at 1 o'clock, what happens on that day is you start in a joint session. So you begin over in the House side. And um, at uh, the way it goes, it goes alphabetically. And so there have been plenty of cases of House members objecting. I will note for David's benefit that the last three Republicans elected president, Democrats have objected to the certification in the House. And so that has transpired. But in this case, you had a Senate match in Arizona. So you adjourned back to your separate chamber. In other words, those things would just fall if there were no senator who was willing to stand with him? They would fall. They're out of order without a Senate companion. In 2004, actually, there was a Senate companion, and Senator Boxer joined House Democrats. And so we actually went through this process with Dick Cheney presiding over it in 2004. Um, but so we go back to the Senate, where if you're vice president, you're president of the Senate. So Pence is presiding. And David, um, at that point, um, I was starved. And so I went to the basement of the Capitol to get a cheeseburger um, while the vice president is presiding over the Senate, because I felt like statutorily it's a two-hour debate. I got two hours. And um, I was waiting for my cheeseburger when the police came rushing in and said, everybody has to evacuate. And so um, at that point, I went from the basement of the Capitol back up to the Senate chamber. And at that point, they had taken the vice president off of the floor and into the ceremonial office, um, which is where the Secret Service um, wanted to, to move him. And um, a couple different times they asked to evacuate the Capitol. But um, you know, the Vice President- He didn't want to go. No, he said, I'm not leaving. And the reason he said he's not leaving is because he said he did not want our adversaries across the globe to see a 15-car motorcade flee in the Capitol. And he said, I'm going to stay here. I'm Did they tell him there was some risk associated with that? Well, the third time they came in, they said, you, we're, they basically didn't give him a choice. They said, we can't protect you behind this glass door, so we got to move you out of this, this chamber. 
and they evacuated him down to a secret location in the bottom of the Capitol. Um, but even there, their desire was to evacuate. They said, we have, a, we have a window. We can get out of here. And Pence said, I'm not leaving. He said, what were you feeling? You're a father. You've got kids. I'm sure your family was watching this. So I, I, I called my wife to let her know that uh, we were in a safe place. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I look, I, I, I think I felt like a lot of people a, um, in anger that this was happening in our capital, um, that um, this, is, this, is not, this is not the way our democracy should function. Um, but I also was very, I think, proud to be, to be with the vice president because I think he exerted enormous leadership under enormous pressure. And I think he, again, uh, despite efforts to have him evacuate, he's like, I don't want that, that visual for the world to see. I'm going to stay here. Do you think that the president bears some culpability for what happened that day? I don't think the president intended um, what happened to happen, David. Um, I think, again, I think that there You heard what he said the other night, right? Uh, I've the, heard it. The, the Jonathan Carl tape, where he basically rationalized what the crowd was doing, chanting, hang Mike Pence, and so on. He said, well, they were very angry, you know. Um, I think, I think that um, I, I don't believe that the, the president ever would have um, wanted physical harm to come to the vice president or his family, David. I, I will never believe that. But, you know, I, I, also, I also believe that it's hard to hear to say those people are just expressing their First Amendment rights or those people are anyhow patriots. Those people were rioters. That was a mob. And, you know, I think when we sit here, again, on, on my side of the aisle, and, and I'm sure this is a more universal opinion, but when we condemn the Black Lives Matter protests and say that those people who destroyed business should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law, we have to be consistent. These people were destroying the Capitol. They threatened physical harm to our elected leaders. To anyway suggest they shouldn't be prosecuted the full extent of the law is in no way consistent. And so I, 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 do, I, I do feel like that that, um, that is disturbing to hear because, um, because those people were thugs and, and certainly they should be prosecuted. So we got to run, but I, I just want to, just to close this out, you know, you talk, we, we talked about faith at the beginning and we talked about Christian values and, and there are values that are universal through different faiths and so on about how one approaches fellow human beings and so on. There is a coarseness to our politics today. Just today, a, a, a legislator was sent, censured by the House for posting an animated cartoon showing him killing another member of the other party and, and attacking the president. Uh, where does this end? How does it end in a way that we can feel hopeful? Well, I, I guess I'm still, I'm still hopeful, David. I, I believe that... Um, well, help the rest of us. Well, sure. I mean, look, you've said this to me yourself. You said the reason you wanted me to come here is because you feel like there's too much division. It's important for people to see that people across the aisle can have a conversation together. It's why I wanted to be here. I think a lot of people should have viewpoint. And I applaud you for doing it. And I thank y'all for being here tonight. And I applaud your university for doing it. But that's a start. But I also feel like, look, traveling around the country for the last um, four years, either with the president or the vice president, I've seen the American people. And I, and I, and I think that, that, that that's not what they want either, David. I think that we have an amazing country with amazing people. And, and, I, and I think that um, there's, a, there's no doubt we're in a polarized moment. We've been in polarized moments in our country's history before. We have a great republic, we have a great constitution, and we will survive this moment too, and we will, we will be better from it. I believe that. Well, we will watch you uh, in the years to come. I think you're gonna continue to travel the country as is the vice president. It'll be interesting to see where your journeys lead you. Uh, but I so appreciate you being here, Mark, and uh, as always, enjoy uh, talking, talking with you about all of this. Uh, and I agree with what you said. We need more conversations like this. So thank you very much. David, thank you for having me. It's my honor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we have a microphone in the back of the room. And anyone who has a question, please, please uh, walk up there. And, and it, 
I want to know who the first person is, because generally when someone breaks the ice, then the line gets very long. So there, here, here are the icebreakers right now. David, IOP, thank you for uh, hosting this. You all do such a great job with uh, presenting us with diverse viewpoints. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zach Cran. I'm a second year MPP at Harris. And uh, Mark, you're in a tough spot, so I'm gonna ask you a tough question. Go for it. Um, there's a lot of people in this room who have uh, very strong viewpoints of the previous administration, but there's also a lot of conservatives that are very disaffected by it as well who probably felt obligated to support President Trump regardless of viewpoints just because he was the Republican president. Tony Fabrizio, as you probably know, uh, has done a lot of polling and his data suggests that President Trump still controls like 90 something percent of the Republican Party. How do you envision the Republican Party moving forward to widen this tent, not necessarily to make it more competitive, but for the good of the country? Uh, thank you, Zach. I, I feel like um, I feel like that's actually not not as difficult an answer as, as you might expect. I look at what I don't. I don't feel like they were just Republicans. I feel like they were supporting Trump because I feel like they're party loyalty. I think, in fact, that for many of us, we look at those um, four years and say there were some historic accomplishments from the tax policy, judicial policy, advocacy for life, what we changed in policy toward Iran, policy shifts to China, rebuilding our, our national defense. I think there's a lot of policies that we can all be really, really uh, proud of and excited about. I think there's a winning coalition there. I think that President Trump brought in something to the Republican Party that tapped into many Midwestern blue collar workers who were tired of a lot of the policies of the past and felt they were, they were no longer represented in Washington. And they wanted somebody who would turn the tables upside down and throw them all out. And I think there's, there's a coalition that can be expanded there that's a winning coalition. I look at what happened in 2020 and say that even though the president lost, it's hard to find examples when the president's party loses the White House, but you actually gain 15 seats in the House. And you look at those 15 new House Republicans, and they're all women or minorities. No white males in those new 15. The party has been expanding, and the party is expanding. I think, you know, David asked me a question earlier about when I, I knew it was over. I, I probably felt that way before Election Day. And the reason I say that is I remember reading a story, um, I'll confess to it, I read the New York Times. <laughs> and they sent a report up to Wisconsin. And this is a, uh, I'm, I'm sure that I'm glossing over some pieces of it because it was a while back. But the gist that I took away is the reporter asked these traditional Democrat or independent voters who had voted for Trump. And they said, um, tell us, you know, tell us why. I said, he did what I wanted. He cut my taxes. I'm a dairy farmer. I got a new deal with dairy in Canada. We were getting a raw deal before. He shut down the border. He took on China. He did everything I wanted. Were you voting for him again? Oh, no, I'm exhausted. Hmm. I can't take it anymore. And basically when your voters are saying, I love all the policies, I can't do this again because I'm exhausted. Um, it's, David's a political mastermind. Maybe he could find a way to elect a candidate who they tell you, you're doing everything I want, but I'm not going to vote for you. I find like that's a pretty hard pathway forward. So, um, so I think that there is actually on the policies a growing coalition that is, is there for our party's taking if we can find the person that can say, I represent the policies of those years, but speak about it in a different way. Thank you. Thank you so much. So not Trump, you're saying? I didn't say that, David. Come on. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to follow along. <laughs> uh, my name is Andrew Simon. I'm a fourth year in the college. I study econ and public policy. Again, thank you so much for your time today. Sure, David. Really, uh, Andrew. Uh, educational. Um, and you spoke earlier about how your faith really informs your principles and your policy. 
And considering like the bedrock foundation of religious freedom and separation of church and state that our founders laid uh, for the nation, I'm curious if you could speak a little bit to uh, how you viewed the separation of church and state in your role as legislative director. Um, I think that um, we advocated um, a lot of religious liberty across the globe from our office. I don't know that there were positions in our legislative affairs that probably directly address your question. I'm not, I, I probably have an interpretation that um, um, says that uh, the state never, ad, the, the Constitution never suggests that you should have freedom from religion. And so I think it's actually a very important part of, of our country's heritage. And, and so I, I'm, I'm probably uh, believe that, uh, that much of what has been written in recent years about separation of church and state is not really what our founders intended. And so I do think they very much intended for us to have freedom of religion and that the state not sanction any one religion, but that doesn't mean we're supposed to drive religion out of our schools, or religion out of our politics, or religion out of our policies. You saw General Flynn the other day said that we should have one, one religion under God. That's what, that's. I'm not sure where he got that. Yeah. Well, I found it alarming, honestly. Well, um, I mean, I'm Jewish, so. <laughs> I'm, I don't I, think he was picking mine. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, pro I probably don't know what he was picking, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I, uh, you may have a, a concern that he has a bigger political following than I do. I'm not too worried about what that following is. He's got one in Bedminster is my, <laughs> may, my uh, I'm not so sure. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, sure. My name is Zachary Leather. I'm a first year in the college. Uh, and my question in my mind is probably a difficult one for a seasoned person like you. It probably isn't. Uh, but you talked a lot about how uh, conservative viewpoints suggest that increased government tends towards decreased personal freedom. Do you not think that something such as the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, uh, OSHA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which I think we all know we follow to the fullest degree on this campus, uh, restricts the freedoms of corporations rather than the freedom of individuals? And do you think that there's any contradiction between prioritizing the freedom of corporations and other groups and the sort of traditional conservative view that you espoused towards uh, protecting the rights and the freedoms of individuals? Yeah, it, a good question. Um, I guess uh, I'll, I'll take an unpopular view that I speak, again, just for myself. So this is Mark Short's viewpoint. Um, I think that there's often legislation that's incredibly well intended but has other impacts. and. You know, I, I've, I was, I don't know if you've ever studied, you said you're studying economics, right? Economics student? No. No, you're not? <laughs> but good guess. Did you, did you say it was the previous gentleman who said he was economics? Yeah, he did. Okay. Um, there's a great economist named Walter Williams who I would encourage you to read his material. And I think the argument he would have made on the Americans with Disabilities Act is that although well-intentioned, um, companies that discriminate against people who are disabled will go out of business on their own. And you don't need government mandates to force that because they're unintended consequences. And so um, I would accept probably a much more limited role of government because I believe market forces have a way of making sure that businesses that would discriminate go out of business. That's the argument, of course, Thank on you. climate that this, is, this change is happening on its own. The question is, um, the pace of change, and if you're a person with disabilities, should you have to wait for it, it, decades yeah. or a lifetime for the market to respond? It's a totally fair question, David. I just still think that typically when the government steps in what they believe is a well-intended um, solution, it ends up creating other problems and continues to encroach. Good. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ricky Gonzalez. I'm a first year, and this is actually my first IOP talk, and it was great. Um, often throughout your talk, you, you said that you uh, lined philosophically um, with members of your team and also Pence himself, and that you also had a, a big value over uh, faith. I, I think that um, having a good personal philosophy is really important to public policy. And if you would have to name one important value, um, whether it's personal or to the team, uh, that you really hold as seminal um, to public policy, what, what kind of value would you say is important to that? Uh, your job, and also to the team, possibly? 
Um, I would say, if you can forgive me, give you two. What I would say is the two principal ones are having humility and servant leadership. And what I mean by that is that I think that Washington, D.C. is intoxicating. And I think that there's a lot of people come to Washington, D.C. for the um, glory and the power of it, as opposed to saying, I need to put my personal ambitions aside and say, what, it, what are the people elected me to do? Who am I serving? As opposed to serving yourself, you're serving the American people who put you there. And so what I would encourage is, uh, is humility and a sense of a servant's heart. We've got, we're, we're sort of out of time, but if we can just quickly hear these next couple of questions okay. and ask them both. I just want to make sure you get your plane. Because you. <laughs> he's trying to get home to his family and I want to make sure he does. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, I'm Ben, I'm a first year studying economics. I was wondering, given your view on the power of like state governments, what do you think of Biden's vaccine mandate for, the, uh, for OSHA? Yeah, I, I, I am strongly opposed to the vaccine mandates. Um, I believe that the vaccines, as I've said to you, are a medical miracle. I had COVID, I got vaccinated. I encourage everybody to get vaccinated. I think that the government forcing the mandates is a really, really bad idea. And I think that um, there are plenty of, uh, of companies that will have significant economic harm because you'll find that a certain percentage of their workforce decides I'm just going to leave. And I think that um, at the end of the day, um, if we're trusting that the vaccines work, uh, we should be pretty confident in that. But, uh, but yeah, I, I'm strongly opposed to the vaccine mandates of the government. Thank you. Last question here. Um, good evening. My name is Nancy. I'm a first year at Harris. Hey, Nancy. Uh, just curious, you kind of spoke to being tough on China as a success of the administration. And um, kind of curious what kind of evidence you have to support that. You know, what I would say is that uh, I think that um, we were not as successful in, in actual trade agreements with China as I wish we had been. But what I would tell you is I think that this administration, the previous administration, isolated China and changed the way a lot of the world views China. And I would say that because of um, the way that our European allies came together uh, in concerns about Huawei and, and espionage that they had there. I would say that based upon the way Australia has, has embraced a different tact toward China and the threat that it poses to them. I would say that, the, that what it really did was to, to force the whole world to look at what China's policies are. In particular, it, it's, it's, it's one belt, one road policy of basically um, investing in third world countries, incurring their debt, and then developing a sense of loyalty from them. I think that the, the whole global conversation about China has changed. And I do think that that was, uh, that was one of the significant accomplishments of the previous administration. Mark, thank you so much again. Good of you to be here. Want to My get pleasure. you home. And thanks, thanks to all of you. And thank you for your good <laughs> question. Thank you. You bet.